Section five of Kazan by James Oliver Curwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Chapter five The Fight in the Snow. They found shelter that night under thick balsam, and when they lay down on the soft carpet of needles which the snow had not covered, Grey Wolf snuggled her warm body close to Kazan and licked his wounds. The day broke with the velvety fall of snow, so white and thick that they could not see a dozen leaps ahead of them in the open. It was quite warm, and so still that the whole world seemed filled with only the flutter and whisper of the snowflakes. Through this day Kazan and Grey Wolf traveled side by side. Time and again he turned his head back to the ridge over which he had come and Grey Wolf could not understand the strange note that trembled in his throat. In the afternoon they returned to what was left of the caribou doe on the lake. In the edge of the forest Grey Wolf hung back. She did not yet know the meaning of poison baits, deadfalls, and traps, but the instinct of numberless generations was in her veins, and it told her there was danger in visiting a second time a thing that had grown cold in death. Kazan had seen masters work about carcasses that the wolves had left. He had seen them conceal traps cleverly, and roll little capsules of strychnine in the fat of the entrails. And once he had put a foreleg in a trap, and had experienced its sting and pain and deadly grip. But he did not have Grey Wolf's fear. He urged her to accompany him to the white hummocks on the ice, and at last she went with him and sank back restlessly on her haunches, while he dug out the bones and pieces of flesh that the snow had kept from freezing. But she would not eat, and at last Kazan went and sat on his haunches at her side, and with her looked at what he had dug out from under the snow. He sniffed the air. He could not smell danger but Grey Wolf told him that it might be there. She told him many other things in the days and nights that followed. The third night Kazan himself gathered the hunt pack and led in the chase. Three times that month, before the moon left the skies, he led the chase, and each time there was a kill. But as the snows began to grow softer under his feet, he found a greater and greater companionship in Grey Wolf and they hunted alone, living on the big white rabbits. In all the world he had loved but two things, the girl with the shining hair and the hands that had caressed him, and Grey Wolf. He did not leave the big plain, and often he took his mate to the top of the ridge, and he would try to tell her what he had left back there. With the dark nights the call of the woman became so strong upon him that he was filled with the longing to go back and take Grey Wolf with him. Something happened very soon after that. They were crossing the open plain one day, when up on the face of the ridge Kazan saw something that made his heart stand still. A man with a dog sledge and team was coming down into their world. The wind had not warned them, and suddenly Kazan saw something glisten in the man's hands. He knew what it was. It was the thing that spat fire and thunder, and killed. He gave his warning to Grey Wolf, and they were off like the wind, side by side. And then came the sound, and Kazan's hatred of men burst forth in a snarl as he leaped. There was a queer humming over their heads. The sound from behind came again, and this time Grey Wolf gave a yelp of pain and rolled over and over in the snow. She was on her feet again in an instant, and Kazan dropped behind her, and ran there until they reached the shelter of the timber. Grey Wolf lay down, and began licking the wound in her shoulder. Kazan faced the ridge. The man was taking up their trail. He stopped where Grey Wolf had fallen, and examined the snow. Then he came on. Kazan urged Grey Wolf to her feet, and they made for the thick swamp close to the lake. All that day they kept in the face of the wind, and when Grey Wolf lay down, Kazan stole back over their trail, watching and sniffing the air. For days after that Grey Wolf ran lame, 
and when once they came upon the remains of an old camp, Kazan's teeth were bared in snarling hatred of the man-scent that had been left behind. Growing in him there was a desire for vengeance, vengeance for his own hurts and for Grey Wolf's. He tried to nose out the man-trail under the cover of fresh snow, and Grey Wolf circled around him anxiously and tried to lure him deeper into the forest. At last he followed her sullenly. There was a savage redness in his eyes. Three days later the new moon came, and on the fifth night Kazan struck a trail. It was fresh, so fresh that he stopped as suddenly as though struck by a bullet when he ran upon it, and stood with every muscle in his body quivering and his hair on end. It was a man-trail. There were the marks of the sledge, the dog's feet, and the snowshoe prints of his enemy. Then he threw up his head to the stars, and from his throat there rolled out over the wide plains the hunt cry, the wild and savage call for the pack. Never had he put the savagery in it that was there to-night. Again and again he sent forth that call, and then there came an answer, and another, and still another, until Grey Wolf herself sat back on her haunches and added her voice to Kazan's and far out on the plain a white and haggard-faced man halted his exhausted dogs to listen, while a voice said faintly from the sledge, "'The wolves, father! Are they coming after us?' The man was silent. He was not young. The moon shone in his long white beard, and added grotesquely to the height of his tall, gaunt figure. A girl had raised her head from a bearskin pillow on the sleigh. Her dark eyes were filled beautifully with the starlight. She was pale. Her hair fell in a thick, shining braid over her shoulder, and she was hugging something tightly to her breast. "'They're on the trail of something, probably a deer,' said the man, looking at the breech of his rifle. "'Don't worry, Joe. We'll stop at the next bit of scrub and see if we can't find enough dry stuff for a fire.' "'We are, boys! Koosh! Koosh!' and he snapped his whip over the backs of his team. From the bundle at the girl's breast there came a small wailing cry, and far back in the plain there answered it the scattered voice of the pack. At last Kazan was on the trail of vengeance. He ran slowly at first, with Grey Wolf close beside him, pausing every three or four hundred yards to send forth the cry. A gray leaping form joined them from behind. Another followed. Two came in from the side, and Kazan's solitary howl gave place to the wild tongue of the pack. Numbers grew, and with increasing number the pace became swifter. Four, six, seven, ten, fourteen by the time the more open and windswept part of the plain was reached. It was a strong pack filled with old and fearless hunters. Grey Wolf was the youngest, and she kept close to Kazan's shoulders. She could see nothing of his red-shot eyes and dripping jaws, and would not have understood if she had seen. But she could feel, and she was thrilled by the spirit of that strange and mysterious savagery that had made Kazan forget all things but hurt and death. The pack made no sound. There was only the panting of breath and the soft fall of many feet. They ran swiftly and close, and always Kazan was a leap ahead, with Grey Wolf nosing his shoulder. Never had he wanted to kill, as he felt the desire in him, to kill now. For the first time he had no fear of man, no fear of the club, of the whip, or of the thing that blazed forth fire and death. He ran more swiftly in order to overtake them and give them battle sooner. All of the pent-up madness of four years of slavery and abuse at the hands of men broke loose in thin red streams of fire in his veins, and when at last he saw a moving blotch far out on the plain ahead of him, the cry that came out of his throat was one that Grey Wolf did not understand. Three hundred yards beyond that moving blotch was the thin line of timber, and Kazan and his followers bore down swiftly. Halfway to the timber they were almost upon it, and suddenly it stopped and became a black and motionless shadow on the snow. 
From out of it there leaped that lightning tongue of flame that Kazan had always dreaded, and he heard the hissing song of the death bee over his head. He did not mind it now. He yelped sharply, and the wolves raced in until four of them were neck and neck with him. A second flash, and the death bee drove from breast to tail of a huge gray fighter close to Gray Wolf. A third, a fourth, a fifth spurt of that fire from the black shadow and Kazan himself felt a sudden swift passing of a red-hot thing along his shoulder, where the man's last bullet shaved off the hair and stung his flesh. Three of the pack had gone down under the fire of the rifle, and half of the others were swinging to the right and the left, but Kazan drove straight ahead. Faithfully, Gray Wolf followed him. The sledge-dogs had been freed from their traces, and before he could reach the man, whom he saw with his rifle held like a club in his hands, Kazan was met by the fighting mass of them. He fought like a fiend, and there was the strength and the fierceness of two mates in the mad gnashing of Gray Wolf's fangs. Two of the wolves rushed in, and Kazan heard the terrific back-breaking thud of the rifle. To him it was the club. He wanted to reach it, he wanted to reach the man who held it, and he freed himself from the fighting mass of the dogs and sprang to the sledge. For the first time he saw that there was something human on the sledge, and in an instant he was upon it. He buried his jaws deep, they sank in something soft and hairy, and he opened them for another lunge, and then he heard the voice. It was her voice. Every muscle in his body stood still. He became suddenly like flesh turned to lifeless stone. Her voice! The bare rug was thrown back, and what had been hidden under it he saw clearly now in the light of the moon and the stars. In him instinct worked more swiftly than human brain could have given birth to reason. It was not she, but the voice was the same and the white girlish face so close to his own blood-reddened eyes held in it that same mystery that he had learned to love. And he saw now that which she was clutching to her breast, and there came from it a strange thrilling cry, and he knew that here on the sledge he had found not enmity and death, but that from which he had been driven away in the other world beyond the ridge. In a flash he turned, he snapped at Grey Wolf's flank, and she dropped away with a startled yelp. It had all happened in a moment, but the man was almost down. Kazan leaped under his clubbed rifle and drove into the face of what was left of the pack, his fangs cut like knives. If he had fought like a demon against the dogs, he fought like ten demons now, and the man, bleeding and ready to fall, staggered back to the sledge marveling at what was happening. For in Grey Wolf there was now the instinct of matehood, and seeing Kazan tearing and fighting the pack, she joined him in the struggle which she could not understand. When it was over, Kazan and Grey Wolf were alone out on the plain. The pack had slunk away into the night, and the same moon and stars that had given to Kazan the first knowledge of his birthright told him now that no longer would those wild brothers of the plains respond to his call when he howled into the sky. He was hurt, and Grey Wolf was hurt, but not so badly as Kazan. He was torn and bleeding. One of his legs was terribly bitten. After a time he saw a fire in the edge of the forest. The old call was strong upon him. He wanted to crawl into it and feel the girl's hand on his head, as he had felt that other hand in the world beyond the ridge. He would have gone, and would have urged Grey Wolf to go with him. But the man was there. He whined, and Grey Wolf thrust her warm muscle against his neck. Something told them both that they were outcasts, that the plains and the moon and the stars were against them now and they slunk into the shelter and the gloom of the forest. Kazan could not go far. He could still smell the camp when he lay down. Grey Wolf snuggled close to him. Gently she soothed with her soft tongue Kazan's bleeding wounds, and Kazan, lifting his head, whined softly to the stars. 
End of chapter 5 of Kazan by James Oliver Curwood. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio.